many of you consider yourselves law-abiding citizens? That's generally at about three quarters. <laughs> How about principled individuals? How many of you consider yourselves principled? What are those laws and principles that, um, that you're abiding by consciously every day? We have a long list of ethical and moral principles that make a lot of sense to us that we really count on. A long list of legal ones. So what are those laws and principles that govern your behavior? Maybe we didn't think they were important. Maybe we didn't think we were having to abide by them. We thought we, we were above them. I don't know, but I know that everybody studies science for 13 years, and everybody should know some of the basic laws and principles that are non-negotiable on this planet, like gravity and others. <laughs> the first law of thermodynamics is the conservation in law. Some people say matter and energy uh, cannot be created or destroyed. Every little kid learns about the rock cycle, the water cycle, the nitrogen cycle. That would be an indicator that materials cycle on this planet because there's no such places away. That's the only place they can go is around and around and around, creating value every time they go around. We actually make something called waste that actually has no value in the system. We're the only ones. Here's the second law. Matter and energy tend to spread spontaneously. Sometimes people say things go, matter and energy go from order to disorder. It's a simple way to say it. Life keeps going on this planet with only what we've got, because nothing appears or disappears. So it's got to create new. It's got to be renewable all the time. There's value in order. The most efficient use of energy is in order. What is the greatest net producer of structure and order on this planet? Green cells are essentially the only net producer of structure and order on this planet. All the services we get for free from nature, what would it cost to replace these services on the market? And the latest statistic is $33 trillion a year, more than any human activity produces. Water, purification, non-renewable resources, renewables, climate regulation, the biodiversity and the gene pool, all these things we get for free from nature. The earth scientists and the historians tell us that they believe that the, the earth has been through four near extinctions before this go round. We weren't here the first few times, so we had nothing to do with that. But the last go round, through a series of explosions and so forth, oxygen was produced, which killed and burned almost everything living on the planet at that moment, except the green cell. And the green cell, it, that situation created favorable conditions for that little green cell to thrive. Nothing else but that at the time. And the green cell then flourished and created more and more favorable conditions for more complex organisms and more and more and more. And then all the dinosaurs and all the, the more complex organisms. And then if this were 100 years, we just got here about a half a second ago. So people often ask me, why biodiversity? What difference does it make to us? It depends on what you want to support. If you want muck and cockroaches, you don't need much <laughs> complexity. They, they'll live anywhere. You want humans, you need all these complex organisms to be thriving in order to create conditions for us to thrive. And what we're concerned about is that we're creating unfavorable conditions for our species to thrive. And this time, we do have something to do with it. We're the ones taken out more faster than can be reproduced and creating unfavorable conditions for our own ability to thrive. Now, that would be unsustainable if we kept going in that direction. We don't educate about unsustainability, we educate for sustainability. We're not okay with that current reality or with the trend down that road.